We're going to determine here how to determine the symmetry point group of a particular molecule. This is a flow chart. There's lots of other different kinds of flow charts. You can find them online or in introductory physical chemistry textbook. And because it's a flow chart, it's uh, not something that you really need to uh, know or understand. It's just a uh, nice way to sort of go here. I mean, if it's a flow chart, you know, somebody with a grade school education could probably figure this out. Uh, so you don't need to memorize this. And eventually, as you work through with symmetry, you'll learn to recognize from structure a particular kind of symmetry group. All right, so uh, before you determine symmetry of a molecule, you have to know the molecule structure. So maybe you remember um, how to determine molecular structure. Uh, from introductory chemistry, you use the valence shell electron pair repulsion model. And that works on uh, pairs of electrons around a central atom. So if you have, um, say, two electron pairs, those electron pairs are arranged in a linear fashion. The idea is how do you get electron pairs? You have these two electron pairs. How do you arrange them so they have minimum repulsion? Well, you put them on opposite sides of a sphere, and that will give you a linear molecule. Three electron pairs. That would give you a trigonal planar structure. Four electron pairs. That will give you a tetrahedral structure, five electron pairs, that will give you a trigonal bipyramid or bipyramidal, the adjective form, and finally six electron pairs, that will give you an octahedral. All right, so depending on number of electron pairs you have around a central atom, you'll have the electron pairs arranged this way. Then to get the structure of the molecule, you have to figure out what electron pairs are involved in bonding to other atoms and what electron pairs are not involved in bonding because the structure of the molecule is determined by where the atoms are, not necessarily where the um, unpaired electrons are unless they're involved in bonding. All right, so first <laughs> to determine symmetry, you have to figure out what the structure of the molecule is and usually use a VSEPR model or you can determine experiment, look it up in Wikipedia or whatever. All right, so once you know the structure, uh, then you um, ask these questions. For example, is it low symmetry? Uh, is it C1 or CS? It has just um, a improper reflection or CI, just an inversion symmetry. If it's low symmetry, it's one of these. And you can determine what that is. If it's high symmetry, is it tetrahedral, octahedral, icosahedral, or is it linear? If that's true, it's one of these. And if not, then a uh, high order rotation axis. If it's CN, uh, do you have perpendicular C2 axis? Yes, you go over here, no, you go over there, and then you go down here, and so on. And eventually you figure out, by following this flow chart, uh, what the symmetry is. All right, so as I say, you don't have to memorize this. Um, you just have to, you know, use this flow chart or something else. Or, you know, I mean, there's probably an app for your phone to determine symmetry. Uh, the computational chemistry programs, you put in molecular structure, you determine symmetry. ChemDraw, if you put in a structure, you determine symmetry. So you really don't have to know how to determine symmetry, just like you don't have to know how to take square roots anymore. You just punch a button on a calculator, you punch a button on a computer program. But this is how you do it if you want to do it by hand. All right, so let's take an example. Chloroform, CHCl3. Oh, well, we got to figure out what the structure of chloroform is and then see what symmetry elements it has. Well, uh, carbon is a central atom. It has four electron pairs around it. All are involved in bonding. So you have an H here, you have a Cl, you have a Cl, and Cl. So you have four electron pairs around this. This implies this is tetrahedral. All right. So tetrahedral structure, but it's not a tetrahedron. If, if this if it were carbon tetrachloride, then it would be a tetrahedron. You'd have one of these high symmetry groups, TD, that's tetrahedral. All right, but it's not one of that because of this H, that's not a CL. 
All right, so let's see if we can draw uh, carbon tetrachloride. Here we'll put uh, the H up here. And then we have, um, say, a Cl coming out here. And we have a Cl going in the back of the plane. And then we have a Cl coming out here. So this would be like the three legs on which carbon is resting. And then you'd have the hydrogen sticking up here. All right, well, let's see. What symmetry elements does this have? This has the E symmetry element, because all of them have the identity element. Maybe you could see that if you draw a axis, which contains the H and the C, that's a threefold axis, because if you rotate it by 120 degrees, that chlorine will be rotated there, that will go over there, and that will go down there. So uh, chloroform has a C3 rotational axis. And if you look at the planes, here's a symmetry plane here, here's a symmetry plane here, and here's a symmetry plane here. Probably kind of hard to see, but that is a symmetry plane. And there are three, we'll call the sigma uh, V. The sigma V, because these planes, these symmetry planes, contain this axis here. And uh, that's just about it. So there's all the three, the elements. And this would be called a C3V, principal axis, C3. And you have three sigma V planes. Sigma V, remember, those are the planes that contain the axis of rotation. So the point group is C3V. Or you can go through the flow chart. And let's just see. So it's not low symmetry. It's not linear. It's not one of those high symmetry groups. And let's look, we have CN. So we have CN, we have a perpendicular, uh, so we have CN, the rotational axis. That was the threefold rotational axis here. So we have C3. Now, does it have perpendicular C2 axes? Okay, so is there a C2 axis perpendicular to the C3? No, there's not. It doesn't seem to work, so we say no. So does is there a sigma H in here? No, there's just sigma V. Sigma V, yes. So here it is. So it's C3V. So that's how you uh, use this flow chart to figure out it's C3V. How about <laughs> uh, CO32 minus, the carbonate ion. All right. So what's the structure of the carbonate ion? CO32 minus. Well, um, carbon, <laughs> if you draw the electron dot structure, uh, it looks something like this. O, 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 2 minus. And this, um, these, uh, this can uh, resonate. So you have a resonance. These bonds are equivalent. But the point is that the carbon has one, two, three electron pairs around it. So this is a trigonal planar structure. Three electron pairs. I'll put pairs in, in quotes because this is not an electron pair. This is two electron pairs. But when you do uh, the Vesper model, remember, you uh, count double bonds the same as single bonds in terms of the repulsion. Okay. Well, so we have three electron pairs, and so this is a trigonal planar. Trigonal planar, okay, well, we'll have a threefold rotational axis um, uh, coming out towards you, and then we have a twofold here, a twofold here, and this O should be here, <laughs> a twofold here. So there's the threefold and the twofolds. We have a reflection plane there, there, and there. We have it. So this has a C3 rotation axis. It has three C2 rotation axes. It has a sigma H. That's the plane of the screen here. This is all in a plane, sigma h. Principal rotation axis is perpendicular to that. That's why it's an h. Um, reflection plane. And it has uh, three sigma v's. OK, there's a sigma v there, sigma v there. All right, well, anyway, let's go through here, through the um, use this chart again. It's not low symmetry. It's not high symmetry. So uh, the highest rotation axis is c3. Now, are there perpendicular c2 axes? The answer is no. There's no perpendicular C2 axes. Um, or actually, yes, sorry. <laughs> what am I saying? There's three perpendicular C2 axes. So the answer is yes, there are. And is there a sigma H? 
Yes, there is. So this is a D. The highest order N is two, uh, three. So this is a D3H. So this is D3H. All right. Let's do um, say one more, um, and that would be how about xenon XeF4? Again, we have to know what the structure of xenon tetrafluoride is. And did that have a charge? No. All right. So xenon has uh, eight, uh, sorry, uh, uh, six electron pairs around it. If you do the Lewis dot structure, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, and then there's one up here, unpaired electron, unpaired electron. Sorry, not unpaired, non-bonding electron, non-bonding electron. But these all lie in the plane. So xenon tetrafluoride is a planar uh, molecule. And in fact, it's square planar. Even though it has six electrons, an octahedral arrangement of electron pairs, uh, it is the molecule itself is planar. And we're going to go the structure of the molecule to determine symmetry. All right, so uh, it has a four-fold rotational axis. There it is. It has uh, two C2 axes, which are perpendicular to that four-fold. It has uh, two sigma uh, H plane, sigma V planes, and it has a sigma H plane. All right, so those are some of the symmetry elements. Let's see if we can figure out the point group is for this flow chart. So it's not low symmetry, it's not high symmetry. It has, what do we say, a C4 principal axis, the one with the highest value of n, so C4. Does it have perpendicular C2 axes? The answer is yes. Here they are, perpendicular C2 axes. So yes, it does. Does it have a sigma h? Yes, it does. That's the in the plane of the molecule. So it's a D4H. So this is D4H. So those are just a couple of examples of how one determines symmetry using that flowchart.